is happening, Magnus? Search. Gotta gotta see the score. I gotta find out the score. Because to me, this way that damn demo was, looks like it's gonna be a 10 out of 10. Let's check this out. Before we begin, a quick note about spoilers. I'm going to do my best to keep this review spoiler free by mostly showing gameplay from the first third or so of the campaign. But some mechanics and talking points I will be going over don't appear until much later. It's all stuff that will be familiar to you if you've watched the Final Fantasy XVI focus scene of play, but if you'd like to go in entirely fresh, you can leave knowing that Final Fantasy XVI is one of my favorites in the series to date. Okay, you've been spoiler warned. Now, on with the review. Even with 16 mainline entries, 20 if you include X2, 13 2, Lightning Returns, and Final Fantasy VII Remake, and a slew of spin-offs, there's no Final Fantasy game quite like Final Fantasy XVI. The latest in this legendary series that is more an evolution different. of the character action genre than the RPG foundation that the franchise was built on. It merges quick, twitch reflexes with character building RPG mechanics, but focuses far more on the former than ever before. And look, it's not a perfect mixture. While the combat is phenomenal for an action RPG, it is admittedly lacking when compared directly to the greats of the character action genre. But even an imperfect mix is potent enough when paired with FF16's epic 50 plus hour story. It's packed with unforgettable characters, outstanding world building, an incredible soundtrack, and knock your socks off moments of sheer spectacle, the likes of which are rarely seen in any game. I figured that. Just playing the demos, like. I wonder what else they got. Because you know they ain't shit show us the best. Final Fantasy 16 picks up the ball that FF14 got rolling and continues to move the series back down the path of high fantasy, taking more than a little inspiration from Game of Thrones along the way. Its story spans decades worth of history in the realm of Alistia, a land brimming with both beauty and death as an encroaching blight forces neighboring kingdoms to fight over untainted resources including five enormous mother crystals that are the primary source of the realm's magic. At the heart of this tale is your character, Clive Rossfield, the eldest prince of the kingdom of Clive Rosaria Barker. and protector of his brother Joshua, the dominant of Phoenix. And if you don't know what that is, don't worry, we'll get to it later, but let's not get bogged down in jargon for now. Clive is a fantastic, well-rounded protagonist, brilliantly brought to life by actor Ben Starr. He undergoes a lot of change and development over the course of the decades-long story, but always remains supremely likable, relatable, and an absolute badass when the need arises, cool. as it very often <laughs> does. We've played your games. That's what I'd like to hear. Now tell me where he is. The rest of the cast is fantastic as well. Jill, played by the excellent Susanna Fielding, is Clive's childhood friend and acts as a wonderful companion that understands and empathizes with Clive on a deep and emotional level. And the tender scenes between them are always a highlight as their relationship grows. Sid is probably my new all-time favorite Final Fantasy character. What trouble are you looking to get yourself into now? The best kind. He's got an almost young Liam Neeson vibe going on, despite being voiced yeah, impeccably by Ralph Ineson, who's having quite a 2023 in the world of video games. Then at least have the decency to join me for supper. Sid is a natural leader, full of charisma and charm, and without going into detail, his cause is one that's very easy to rally behind and made me excited to follow him and his band of outlaws. The greatest achievement of Final Fantasy XVI's story, though, is how it never leaves you to drown in its lore. This is a massive world, complete with five kingdoms, each with their own forms of government, rulers, religions, and ideals. A whole encyclopedia's worth of realm-specific terms, like bearers, icons, and dominance, and a grand history of the world that you're expected to keep up with if you want to get the most out of the big story beats. It would all be a little overwhelming if not for an ingenious quality of life feature that I truly hope becomes standard throughout all story-heavy video games, Active Time Lore. At any point during any main story cutscene or conversation, you can hold down the DualSense touchpad to bring up a series right. of contextual compendium entries that are relevant to what's going on in that scene. So, anytime a character mentioned a term, character, or location that I either didn't know about or needed a reminder about, they're freed Imperial Paris. I could bring up the active time lore 
and a succinct entry would be right there to get me up to speed. <laughs> These entries change with the events of the story too, updating with new information about the state of the world and Clive's knowledge about it as it happens. Having this kind of feature was a godsend. Later on, big missions are also preceded with stylish history lessons by your crew scholar that fill you in on what you need to know about the region you're about to visit, who the rulers are, their ambitions, their allies, their enemies, and so on. I know that might sound like school, but it actually did a really effective job of bringing me into and keeping me invested in the realm of Alistia. One of the most interesting elements of the story, and one that also ends up being an awesome addition to the already excellent combat, is the existence of Icons and Dominance. Icons are supremely powerful beings that Final Fantasy fans will recognize as the usual summons from previous mm -hmm. games, and Dominants are the special humans who are able to tap into their power, even to the point of fully transforming into them. Dominants are so powerful that they're almost used like nuclear deterrents, saved as a last resort due to the potential mutually assured destruction that would be caused by their fights. But fight they will, and every time they do, it's an unforgettable scrap of gargantuan proportion. I'd be remiss to spoil these encounters by talking too much about them, but yeah, I will say they're that. absolute spectacles. Some are like giant kaiju fights mixed in with Dragon Ball Z. Others take the <laughs> gameplay in a completely different direction and play out like a Panzer Dragoon level. But nearly all of them brought back memories of playing Ostra's Wrath or God of War 3, and that feeling of just being absolutely floored <laughs> by the breathtaking sense of scale and overwhelming power. I had so much fun playing that damn demo, I can't wait. Final Fantasy has been shifting further and further away from its turn-based RPG roots for a long time now, and with Final Fantasy 16, it feels like a metamorphosis that has been in the works for years is finally yeah. complete. Oh, Final cool. Fantasy 16's combat is a straight-up action game. Full stop. It's fast, flexible, extremely reflex-driven, and is full of opportunities to absolutely style on your enemies with air combos, jump cancels, <laughs> and a huge arsenal of extremely powerful spells and abilities. Ooh. I never got that off. Yeah, there's something I was doing Some wrong with that particular are made to one's powers. This transformation. You only ever control one character. Levels are far more linear than they've been in the past, and many of the actual RPG elements have been made to play second fiddle in ways I'll discuss shortly. Purists might not be a fan of these drastic changes, but I found this approach far more preferable to FF15's more hybrid team of combat and equally enjoyable. I was wondering if I would have a problem with it, but I don't. Despite how chaotic the action may look, it's actually elegantly simple once you break it down. Yeah, Clive you can execute a four hit melee out. combo by mashing square, he can shoot magic with triangle to hit enemies at a distance, he can use an ability unique to whatever icon power he currently has equipped. And he also has access to up to two abilities from that icon as well. In familiar Final Fantasy fashion, for bigger enemies and bosses, there's a stagger meter that you can fill by landing attacks. And once it's full, they can be put into a staggered state, giving you an opportunity to build up a multiplier and lay down huge amounts of damage for a limited amount of time. Yes. Much of the skill involved with combat comes from your ability to quickly stagger enemies and then maximize the amount of damage you're able to do while they're staggered by optimally using your skills and switching between your icons. To that end, there's a lot of smart mechanics in place that reward skillful play. If you just mash the attack button, you won't build up stagger very quickly. But if you use carefully timed magic attacks in between your melee attacks, you'll execute magic bursts, which do more damage and build more stagger. On top of that, perfectly timed evasions give opportunity for counterattacks that deal big stagger damage, or if yeah. you're feeling extra fancy, you could try to time an attack to clash with theirs to trigger a parry, which uh. slows down time and allows for even more punishment. <laughs> it's a great combat system that kept my brain firing at a rapid pace as I balanced timing my magic bursts with managing my skill cooldowns and keeping an eye out for enemy tells to be ready to dodge. On top of just trying to look cool for the sake of looking cool, which is always an important element of any action game in my book. Yeah, boy. <laughs> touches is that you can issue commands to your Hound Torval, one of which will launch weaker enemies, allowing me to zip right to them in the air, juggle them with some quick aerial hits, and then send them crashing back down with an explosive Helm Splitter style attack. All that said, this is a long game, and while you I'm do sure. pretty regularly get new icons and abilities, 
Eight, don't change up combat in ways that make your basic fights substantially different Ooh. or more engaging. Well, that means how many, how? They do eventually lose some of their luster. That isn't helped by lots of recycled enemy types in the open fields and when your dungeons that you explore either. At least the bosses were always fresh and exciting with many playing with some fun Final Fantasy tropes, like having the names of big attacks show up on screen, and some exceptionally dangerous techniques, even having a countdown that ends with an extremely powerful blow if you're unable to do enough damage to stop them from getting it off. Many of the bigger boss battles also have QTEs that do a wonderful job of adding extra cinematic flair and punctuate the different phases of the fight. Did somebody with say flair? Awesome Woo! As touched upon earlier, the weird twist of Final Fantasy XVI is that while the action elements are all top-notch, the RPG elements are a little underdeveloped. Loot seems like an afterthought. I never once felt incentivized to explore either the corners of the linear main levels or the open fields of the interconnected overworlds. Hmm. And in general, there just aren't a ton of character building choices that you can make to customize Clive in any sort of unique way. The deepest it gets is that you can equip Clive with up to three accessories that can have a variety of useful effects, usually powering up specific special abilities, increasing your combo damage, or increasing healing potency. You also begin with a total of five special rings that are designed to take some of the edge off of combat in lieu of lower difficulty modes. One essentially lets you mash square and let the AI take the wheel as it automatically casts spells, switches icons, and uses basic attacks while another will automatically dodge as long as an attack is capable of being avoided. While I personally didn't feel the need to use these rings, I do appreciate their inclusion as a completely optional way to adjust the difficulty in very specific ways. Hmm. Of course, the downside is that if you do equip them, you won't have the space for other stat-altering accessories, thus removing the one element of RPG-like customization altogether. But where Final Fantasy XVI really impressed me was in the quality of its side quests. Well, eventually. They actually start out pretty generic and menial, with objectives like finding X number of Y items out in the field, or delivering three hot bowls of soup to people in the hideout. However, in the back half of the story, these side quests act as smart ways to button up all the loose threads outside of the main campaign. Side characters are given proper send-offs, pieces that were toppled over in the central story are satisfyingly built back up, and characters that you wouldn't really expect to have very deep backstories open up to you in often very moving ways. It's exactly the kind of side content that I want in a big RPG, even though it takes a little while to get there. In addition to side quests, there's also a bounty board that you can use to locate exceptionally challenging monsters for some greater rewards. Many of them are just stronger versions of enemies that you've already fought, but others are boss encounters sure. into themselves and make up some of the hardest fights available. All nice. considered, there's a fair amount of extra content here to keep you this, <laughs> and you'll want I to like do as that. much of it as you can to be ready for New Game Plus, which significantly ups both the challenge and the level cap, and introduces new gear upgrades. Even beyond that, there's also an arcade mode that you can use to go through previous levels and try to set high scores to upload to an online leaderboard. Hmm. Needless to okay. say, there's a lot to do even once the credits finish rolling. And oh my god, the soundtrack by Muhammad's Grace, the soundtrack! It manages to perfectly accompany every big scene, whether it's the tender moments between Clive and Jill. They kind of look like some AI pictures that we be seeing on Instagram, away, didn't they? Or the absolutely epic battles between icons. A lot of those those AI pictures be uh, I don't know if I'm right extra to jagged and sharp and of all time points everywhere. Yet, but and, it's certainly one of the best soundtracks of 2023 so far. Final Fantasy XVI looks stunning too. The performance may not hold onto a consistent 60 FPS all the time, even on the prioritized frame rate graphical setting, but those minor hiccups don't stop it from still being one of the most gorgeous games I've ever played. So it's a 9 then. I feel like everything he says it makes it a 9. Final Fantasy XVI will likely be looked back upon as a turning point for the mainline Final Fantasy games taking its combat fully in the direction of an action game. But I hope that conversation doesn't overshadow its dark and captivating tale, its memorable characters, and the innovative ways in which it helps you keep track of it all. The active time lore feature is incredible, 
it should be standard for all story-driven games going forward. And while the combat may not live up to the sky-high standards as some of the best games in the character action genre, among other action RPGs, it's near the top of the heap. Pair all of that with one of the best soundtracks of the year, incredible performances from top to bottom, and drop-dead gorgeous visuals, and you've got a game worthy of an orchestral Final Fantasy victory fanfare. Orchestral? What I tell you? What I tell you? <laughs> For more Final Fantasy 16, make sure to check out the first minutes of the game. And for everything else, keep it here on IGN. <laughs> Let's get it! Woo! I think I already purchased mine. I swear I did. If not, I'm going to go do it now. Oh, yeah. Let's get there. Post comments down below. Let me know what you all think. Are you getting it or are you not? If you enjoyed my reaction and thoughts to this review, hit the like button, subscribe, and share. 10 million subscribers. Woo!